Hi everyone, this is going to be the third lesson on the topic of the kinetic theory of matter for GCSE physics students. In this lesson, we're going to revisit the idea of temperature and disambiguate the definitions of temperature, heat, and internal energy. Now, as I've said before, temperature is something which uh, we, we encounter in this topic of the kinetic theory of, ma of matter, but we also encounter it in uh, a later topic where we're going to be talking about energy. And so we're going to be looking at the concepts of internal energy, temperature and heat again in the last topic of this physics course. Now, in the uh, last lesson, we looked at the definition of temperature as being, and also the lesson before um, that one, as being connected to the average kinetic energies of particles. But uh, very often, uh, people may, particularly non-physicists, will use the words temperature and heat almost as though they mean the same thing. Uh, and as we'll see, this is not the case. So really, this lesson is going to be about, about defining some very critical terms and being able to use them correctly in our descriptions, our explanations, and also our quantitative understanding in terms of equations. Now, in this lesson, we're going to focus on the qualitative aspects of this, the descriptive um, and explanatory uh, ways in which we can use the word temperature and also the other terms, heat, thermal energy and internal energy. So by the time you've completed watching this lesson video, and also if you're watching it on uh, its page on my website, when you've finished doing all of the uh, interactive questions that will pop up at various points in this video, together with the other learning activities such as the um, end of lesson quiz for this lesson, you should be able to do the following things. So we need to distinguish between these terms, temperature, heat, and internal energy, and define what we mean by these terms in general. So we've already def defined temperature in a qualitative sense as being uh, related to the average kinetic energies of the particles of a substance. Now, in GCSE physics, we don't necessarily have to define temperature quantitatively, um, because in order to do that, we need to invoke the uh, zeroth law of thermodynamics and other laws of thermodynamics. And this is something that you encounter really more in A-level physics than you do at GCSE physics. But a qualitative understanding of temperature is important, as long as you can distinguish between temperature and these other quantities, such as heat, internal energy, thermal energy, and so on. So we also need to go on to define heat, and as we'll see, heat is the transfer of thermal energy from an object or system at higher temperature to an object or system at lower temperature. We need to define thermal energy and internal energy as well, and we also need to see what the connection is between these concepts. So there's a lot of definition involved uh, in this lesson, which we're going to be making reference to uh, in later lessons of both this topic and the energy topic as well. So let's start by recapping what we know about temperature. So temperature formally is a measure of the average kinetic energies of the particles of a substance. Now informally, uh, we can describe temperature operationally as the degree of hotness or, ch uh, or coldness on a particular chosen scale. So obviously there are many different scales of temperature, including the Celsius scale, which is defined in terms of the freezing and uh, boiling points of water. <clears throat> now. When we define temperature in an operational sense, what we're doing is we're relying upon properties of materials such as water, for example, and the temperatures at which certain things happen to those materials. So thermometers of all descriptions uh, will measure some kind of thermometric variable, some measurable quality of physical materials, which varies um, according to the temperature of those materials. So in the case of a uh, thermometer such as this one, we're measuring the change in the volume of a liquid such as alcohol uh, in relation to temperature. In the case of other types of thermometers such as these, we are measuring another kind of property of matter. So for example, in the case of this thermometer here, we're measuring the change in the resistance of a, a material as the electrical resistance as its temperature rises and falls. Now, there is an absolute scale of temperature called the Kelvin scale. On this scale, um, the zero point of the scale is the absolute zero of temperature, the lowest possible temperature uh, that we can possibly reach. So Kelvin is called the absolute scale of temperature because it is a scale of temperature which relates to the actual theoretical definition of temperature, which is connected to the average kinetic energies of particles. So at zero Kelvin, the particles have zero kinetic energy.
Now, what that means is you can't have negative numbers on the on the Kelvin scale. As the particles increase from zero Kelvin, uh, or uh, as the temperature of a substance increases from zero Kelvin, the particles are moving faster and faster on average. But at zero Kelvin, the particles have no kinetic energy at all. So we've defined temperature qualitatively as a measure of the average kinetic energies of the particles. At any given temperature above zero Kelvin, there might be some particles in an object which are moving faster, some particles which are moving slower, but the average kinetic energy of the particles at that, uh, temp uh, at that temperature is what defines the value of that temperature on the Kelvin scale. The higher the temperature on the Kelvin scale, the faster on average they're moving. The lower the temperature, the slower on average they're moving. So how does this then relate to the concept of heat then? Well, heat is a measure of the transfer of thermal energy from a hot object or system to a colder object or system. Now, we need to, at this point, draw a distinction between these terms. We need to define what we mean by temperature, heat, and also thermal energy, and another quantity that we call internal energy. Now, in order to do this, we need to invoke some of the concepts that we're going to be encountering again later on in the energy topic. So, just remember at this point, though, heat is a transfer. It's a measure of the amount of energy transferred from a hot object to a cold object. And as such, it's measured in the same units as energy is measured, namely the joule. So, um, the next couple of lessons will be making use of some of these ideas. So, the next lesson will be on the various ways in which heat is transferred, conduction, convection and infrared radiation. But the lesson after that one will be looking at the way in which objects increase and decrease in temperature according to a, 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 um, a coefficient that we call the specific heat, the specific heat capacity of a substance. So this lesson here, the fifth lesson in this topic, will deal with what happens when we supply heat energy to an object and its temperature rises, or as we take heat energy away from an object and its temperature falls. The lesson after that one will be talking about another situation entirely, uh, changes of physical state. Now changes of physical state happen at a constant temperature even though we are either heating the object or cooling the object. So in order to understand uh, what happens to an object to cause its temperature to rise or fall, or what happens under conditions where we're heating something and it's melting or boiling, or we're cooling something and it's freezing and condensing. So the groundwork that we're laying here will allow us to understand these concepts a little bit more rigorously. So what do all these terms mean then? So let's give ourselves some definitions here. <clears throat> so let's start with our definition of temperature once again. So um, it's always a good idea to take notes, by the way. So uh, I realize that while I have defined these in the in the slides that uh, have um, the slides that we've already encountered, it might be worth writing them down here just so that we can compare them to each other. So temperature is a measure of average kinetic energies of particles of an object. So that's what temperature is. Now heat, this refers to the transfer of thermal energy from a hotter, in other words, higher temperature object or system to a colder, or in other words, lower temperature object or system. <clears throat> so, now we've invoked this term thermal energy, which will require a little bit of explaining. There are a couple of other terms here that we need to define. We need to define thermal energy and we need to define um, internal energy. So we have here, let's, let's imagine we're taking an object. Let's say, for example, this pen. So this pen is made up of particles. Those particles are in the solid state, except uh, uh, if 
and it's all a solid because this is not a pen that has ink in it. This is the pen that I'm using to make these notes on a graphics tablet. But in any case, if we imagine a solid object, those particles are arranged in the solid state. That is to say that they are all vibrating around fixed average positions in a uh, in a structure, a lattice structure in that solid, which means that if this pen is sitting motionless on a table relative to us, the observer, it has no mechanical kinetic energy. It's not moving. However, there are particles that it's made up of which are moving. Now, if we imagine each one of those particles moving, then each particle that makes up this pen has a specific amount of kinetic energy at any given time. Therefore, if we take if we add all of those kinetic energies of all of those moving particles together, there is a certain amount of energy uh, in, stored in the motions of the particles of this pen. Now, as the temperature of the pen rises, the average kinetic energies of those particles also increases, which means that their average rate of motion, their speed, increases, which in turn means that the average kinetic energies, the, the total energy stored in the motions of the particles of the pen is higher at a higher temperature and lower at a lower temperature. What we're talking about here is the thermal energy of the object of the pen. So we have here a definition of thermal energy. So thermal energy, <clears throat> thermal energy we can define as the sum of the kinetic energies of the microscopic particles and sub-microscopic particles. Of course, uh, these particles can't be seen with an ordinary light microscope. Um, the sum of the energies of the microscopic particles which make up an object. So even if the object is not moving on the macroscopic scale, the object is not moving to the left relative to us, it's not moving to the right relative to us or in any other direction, it is stationary relative to the observer, it has no mechanical kinetic energy. But the particles, as long as the object is above absolute zero, the particles are moving. And so if we add together all of the kinetic energies of the particles of the object, we have the thermal energy of the object. But there are other things going on. So the energy of any system or any object, the total energy at any given time, so for an object or system, at any point in time, we can write the following expression describing the total energy of the system total energy of the system is equal to the sum of the kinetic energies of the system plus the total potential energy of the system. So K, we're using K to mean the kinetic energy of the system. And U, we're using as a symbol for the total potential energy of the system. Now, this speaks to a concept that we'll encounter in the energy topic. Uh, many of you will in, uh, have encountered this idea uh, that there are different forms of energy. Uh, and you may have heard this described in terms where you have, for example, light energy and heat energy and electrical energy and sound energy and nuclear potential energy and elastic potential energy and all of these different so-called forms of energy. That's actually not particularly rigorous or correct language to be using. There are only really two forms of energy uh, when, we're, when, we're dis when we're considering an object or a system of objects. Um, there, are, there is kinetic energy and there is potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy stored uh, in a system or an or an object because it is moving or because there is motion. So kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of things. Potential energy is the energy associated with the positions of things uh, or the arrangements of things. So for example, um, this pen, if I hold it above the ground, it has 
gravitational potential energy because in order to raise it from the ground, I have had to do work against the force of gravity. Now, if I drop the pen, that gravitational potential energy, and again, it's potential energy because it is energy stored in this system by, by means of the position of the pen above the ground. If I then release the pen, then the force of gravity will accelerate the pen downwards and that gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. However, consider what happens when the pen hits the ground. As soon as the pen hits the ground, once it's stopped moving, there is no gravitational potential energy, there's no kinetic energy. So where is the energy gone? Well, the energy hasn't disappeared. The law of conservation of energy dictates that the energy must have been transferred to some other form or to some other, other system. And it has. Uh, the macroscopic uh, mechanical kinetic energy with which the object hit the ground is transferred into sound that we can hear as the object hits the ground and also into thermal energy of the pen, of the particles of the pen and also the particles of the ground. And so after the collision between the pen and the ground, the the pen and the ground with which it makes contact are, are slightly higher in temperature because some of that energy has been converted into the thermal energy of the particles that make up the pen and the ground. And so the total energy of the system has always stayed the same. When I raised the pen above the ground to this point, I did work against the force of gravity. And so the system has stored energy in, uh, as potential, as gravitational potential. When I release the pen, the gravitational potential is converted into kinetic. When the kinetic uh, when the energy, uh, when the pen hits the ground, the kinetic energy, the macroscopic kinetic energy of the system is converted into the microscopic kinetic energies of the particles of the pen and the ground and also into some sound. Now the sound is also a transfer of kinetic energy through the particles of the air surrounding the pen. And so we see here that the total energy of the system overall has remained the same. So the thermal energy of the system is simply the sum of the kinetic energies of the particles of a system. But what about the internal energy? Well, again, going back to the example of the pen, yes, the pen is made up of particles, but those particles don't just have kinetic energies on the microscopic scale, they also have potential energies. This includes, for example, the potential energies due to the electrostatic forces of attraction between the atoms that make up the pen. So atoms, electrically attract each other into molecules. Molecules also electrically attract each other to form solids, liquids, and gases. And there's also nuclear potential energy stored inside the atoms, inside the nuclei of atoms. And so all of that is the uh, potential energy stored inside the pen. So on the macroscopic scale, in the example that we looked at, the pen, when I raise it above the ground, has gravitational potential energy. That gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy as the object falls towards the ground. However, at all points uh, above the ground, while it's falling and uh, when it hits the ground, the molecules that the, pe the pen is made up of and the atoms that make up those molecules also have their own microscopic potential energies. The potential energies due to chemical bonding are due to the positions and the arrangements of atoms at either ends of chemical bonds within molecules. The potential energy, the nuclear potential energy stored inside atoms is due to the positions and the arrangements of protons and neutrons in their nuclei. And so a system contains both um, kinetic energy on the microscopic scale and potential energy on the microscopic scale. So whether you're talking about macroscopic systems or microscopic systems, there is always kinetic energy and potential energy to consider. So what, so how do, how do we make use of this in the current context in what we're discussing? Well, the internal energy of this pen is not just the thermal energy. The thermal energy is part of the energy stored in the pen. It's the energy stored due to the motions of the particles of the pen. But those particles also have their own microscopic potential energies as well. So we can talk about the total energy stored in the pen as being the internal energy of this object. The internal energy uh, of an object is the sum of the thermal energy 
Remember, the thermal energy is the sum of the kinetic energies of the microscopic particles that make up the object. So and the internal energy of the object is that and the potential energy. of an object or system. So on the microscopic scale, the sum of the kinetic energies of the particles of an object makes up its thermal energy, but that is only part of the internal energy stored inside this object. There is also the uh, potential energies of the particles stored in the chemical bonds, in the intermolecular bonds, and even in the nuclei of the atoms themselves. So this is what we mean by internal energy. Internal energy is the sum of the microscopic kinetic energies of the particles of an object and the microscopic potential energies of the particles of an object. Now, when we're talking about heating, when we're talking about the transfer of heat from one object to another, what we're saying is, so if we imagine we have a hot object, and it's hot in the sense that it is at a higher temperature than its surroundings. In fact, let me make use of a different color here. So we have a hot object, and I'll put hot in inverted commas here because we're using hot as a euphemism here for an object at a higher temperature than its surroundings. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to be looking at the various ways in which the thermal energy of this object, remember the thermal energy is the energy of the particles uh, moving around, can be transferred into its surroundings. Now, if we have a hot object, it means that it is at a higher temperature than its surroundings. It has a higher internal energy because it has a higher thermal energy stored within it. Now, um, heat will therefore be transferred from this hot object into the surroundings like this. Now, most people would say, would, would intuitively understand this to be the case. The direction of heat transfer, energy transfer, is from a hot object into its cooler surroundings until thermal equilibrium is reached, until the object and the surroundings are at the same temperature. However, it's a little bit more involved than this. So this object is transferring heat into the surroundings, but the surroundings are also transferring heat back to the object. The, the net transfer though is from the object to the surroundings because the surroundings are transferring heat energy back into the object at a slower rate than the heat is flowing out of the object into the surroundings. So this is the actual situation where we've got net heat output from this object. So what's happening here for this system is that the kinetic energy of the object, uh, the kinetic energies of the particles of the object, the thermal energy is slowly decreasing because the net average movement of energy is from the object to its surroundings. There is some conduction and radiation happening into the object from its surroundings. So for example, even though the particles of, let's say if this object is sitting in air, even though the particles of the atmosphere around it are at a lower temperature, they're moving at a lower average kinetic energy than the particles in the object, some of them are still colliding with the surface of the object. And so there is some conduction of heat into the object from the surroundings, but there is far more heat flowing out of the object into the surroundings than there is flowing into the object from the surroundings. And so the net transfer, transfer of thermal energy is from the hot object to the cooler surroundings. So this is, this is uh, what we would describe as cooling of the hot object. Cooling of a hot object, the decrease in temperature is because overall, the overall direction of energy transfer by heating is from the hot object to the surroundings. So the hot object cools, its average kinetic energies of its particles decrease because they are emitting uh, infrared radiation into the surroundings. So they're transferring some of their energy to the surroundings like that. They are also transferring some of their energy to the surroundings by conduction.
Now, if we contrast this with uh, a, an object which is cold, in other words, it is cooler than its surroundings, it's at a lower temperature than its surroundings, then again, it's fairly intuitive to most people that the, uh, the, the direction of energy transfer is like this, from the surroundings, which are hotter, into the colder object. So if we imagine um, we have uh, a cold object and we hold it in the palm of our hands, it feels cold to us because the heat, the uh, thermal energy in our hand is being transferred to the object itself. And so that's fairly intuitive. But in fact, what's happening is the cold object is still transferring some energy to its surroundings by conduction and radiation. But the rate at which that's happening is much lower than the rate at which it is absorbing heat energy from its surroundings. So in this case, again, the net transfer, the overall transfer of thermal energy um, is from, is to rather, the cold object from its hotter surroundings. So this is uh, sometimes a little bit, um, is, is this is a point which is sometimes lost um, when considering heating or cooling. Just remember that at always, whenever there is no thermal equilibrium, whenever you have objects uh, at a different temperature to their surroundings, um, there is always a flow of heat in both directions. But when you are cooling down, when a hot object is cooling down, it's because there is more heat flowing out of it by conduction and convection or radiation uh, than there is flowing into it. If an object is heating up, then there is more heat flowing into it than there is flowing out of it. There's always a bi-directional flow of heat, but the net transfer of heat is the overall transfer of heat. In the case of a hot object uh, in colder surroundings, the net transfer is outwards from the object. In the case of a colder object in hotter surroundings, the net flow of heat is into the object. <clears throat> so when we're talking about heating then, when we say that we are heating this beaker of water, we are increasing its temperature, it's the process of adding heat energy to an object. It's a process of increasing its thermal energy by transferring heat into the particles of the object. So the temperature of the object will rise until eventually it will be, uh, or the temperature of the object will rise above its surroundings as a result of heating. In contrast, when we talk about cooling, the temperature of the object will be falling because it's the process of losing heat energy, losing thermal energy due to the transfer of heat at a greater rate than at which it is taken up. So under those circumstances, the temperature of the object will fall relative to its surroundings. Okay, everyone, that's going to do it for this lesson. I hope that was useful to you and I will see you in the next one. Take care.